Now imagine, if you will, that you're sitting courtside at the NBA playoffs. There's 10 seconds left in the game, and it's a tied game. LeBron gets the ball, goes up for the shot, and the entire arena goes quiet as everybody waits to see if the ball will go into the basket. But you sit there confidently, already feeling the net expand. You already knew the ball was going to go into the basket before it passed the rim. So two things. One, congrats on your court side seats, and I feel like we should be friends. But secondly, how would you even know? Well, it turns out lots of things are very feelable about basketball. There's the swoosh of the basket. There's the dribble going up and down the court. Even the music they play in between points is all something that you can feel. And people can feel this thanks to my research into a new audio technology that combines touch and hearing to create these hyper-realistic experiences in any seat. So my name is Ethan Castro. I'm a PhD student here at UCR, as was said. But before I came to UCR, I was actually a music engineer and a music producer. And that means not only did I make music, but I was also responsible for making it sound good. Uh, that means I worked with many of the major record labels and some artists that you probably don't know, uh, some kid named D-Rake, uh, some thug who was young, and the 21 of the Savages or something like that. I don't know, kids and their names, right? <laughs> but uh, something else you have to know about me is I'm, as was mentioned, I'm hard of hearing. And I actually have two types of hearing loss, uh, conductive and sensory neural. And that means that the eardrum and the little bones in my ear don't actually conduct the signal to the nerve, which, surprise, surprise, also doesn't transmit the signal correctly to my brain. So if you're looking at the characteristics of a good audio engineer, that's definitely not on the list. That's almost like hiring a colorblind artist to paint a rainbow for you. <laughs> but you have to understand, my care team when I was growing up was less inclined to help me have a fantastic musical career, and instead we're trying to be more focused on making sure I survive in the world. In fact, they said, as long as he doesn't go into music, he'll be just fine. <laughs> I see the irony is not lost on many of you. Uh, like an obedient child, I did exactly the opposite of what they recommended, and I was a DJ, a producer, a drummer, a percussionist, uh, anything to do with music and sound, I was there in it, completely against both uh, my doctor's and my parents' wishes. Uh, but throughout all that performance, I started realizing something. I could actually hear better. In fact, I was able to completely transform my relationship with sound because I was able to perceive the vibrations that were coming off of it. In fact, that became my secret weapon. I would walk into studios when I was making music for other artists, and as long as there were speakers on the desk, I could touch those speakers and be directly coupled to the song or to the sound that they were making. I didn't realize this, but for the past 20 years performing, I was training myself to accurately perceive sound from just vibrations. But today, my research shrinks that training time from 20 years down to about 20 minutes. My fantastic team and I have essentially invented a way for you to feel and hear every single detail and nuance of sound and music clearly and equally. And we call it embodied sound. But before we get into what embodied sound is, let's first kind of get a little bit of a refresher course of what regular sound is, right? So, I'm sure most of you know this, but just in case, uh, sound is kind of everywhere, right? In fact, let's take this exact example, right? I have a microphone. There are speakers in this room. Yeah? So this microphone is actually taking a perspective of the sound waves coming out of my voice, and it's sending those, that perspective to a mixer that's behind the room, and it's sending it to an amplifier, which, surprise, surprise, amplifies the sound, right? And that sound is then coming out into the room here. But that begs a really important question. Is everyone in the back receiving the same experience as the people in the front row? The people in the front row, they can see me, of course. They can hear me. But they can also feel a little bit of my vibrations as I speak. There's vibrations that come off of your chest when you meet someone in real life. And sometimes, if they get a little too close, I might sweat a little bit on them. So I'll try not to. But the people in the back don't get that experience. They can see me, yes, and they can hear me, but they're only hearing me, if they can hear me from here, it's great, but that's probably because they're getting the facsimile from the speakers around us. And take that one step further. Those of you watching online, 
You're probably watching through your phone, your tablet, your laptop, computer maybe, uh, or your TV. Do you believe that you're having the same experience that these people in the audience are having? I mean, I think we all know qualitatively, probably not, right? That's why we go to live concerts and live events. But what if there's a way we could quantify where they are, their total experience, and quantify your real experience, and start figuring out a way to bridge the gap between? In order to do that, we gotta borrow things from fields outside of my own, uh, psychology and physics. I'm probably gonna to this, so please don't hurt me, but uh, psychology, as I understand it, helps us understand how we perceive the world, and physics kind of more or less helps us quantify it. And by combining them into a subgroup called psychophysics, we can learn what we can do in the real world that can help trigger certain perceptual experiences. Sounds crazy, right? I, uh, here's an example. 3D movies, right? 3D movies completely take advantage of how the brain processes depth. And they trick your brain into believing that there's a three-dimensional object coming out of a clearly two-dimensional space. How does that apply to acoustics? Well, luckily, if we just slap on acoustics to psychophysics, we can come up with a fancy word called psychoacoustics. And you've actually interacted with this probably much more than you've ever realized. Psychoacoustics helps us understand how the brain processes sounds in the real world. And you've probably experienced it in one of two ways, stereo sound and the Doppler effect. So stereo sound is very similar to 3D movies, where you have two speakers on a 2D plane, and it can help convince you that there's a vocalist in front, there's a drum set maybe in the back, and there's maybe guitars and bass on both sides, even though they're not actually there, right? Crazy. And the Doppler effect is that thing where when there's a siren coming at you, it sounds higher pitch coming towards you than it does leaving you. It sounds lower pitch as it goes away. And if we can quantify these effects, we can then replicate them in a different place, like a virtual world. So that's kind of the reason why video games start sounding so good lately, is because we're able to quantify these things in the real world and replicate them in a video game. So in a video game, if there's a train coming at you, you can actually tell that it's coming from a direction and it's coming at you with a certain acceleration and velocity, and then you can tell that it's leaving you the same way. But something that you have to kind of realize, that only works if you can hear. But does that mean people who can't hear completely lose out in all these cool things? It may not be the way you think. So let's break down what hearing is. It's getting really deep here. So my understanding, hearing is the basis of receiving a signal, right? Think of it like a walkie-talkie, right? Someone transmits something and then someone receives it on the other side. The way you could say that like you're sending a digital signal and it gets received and turned back into an analog or in this case, interpreted. So that's kind of how I like to think it. You can kind of in infer that hearing is kind of like an interpretation. So let's check it out. You can hear someone yell at you. You can hear music down the hall, right? If you're in an apartment, you hear your neighbors playing music. You can hear me right now. But just because you can hear me does not mean that you might successfully interpret what's happening or what's going on. So we might have to rethink that a little bit. For example, you can hear someone yell at you and have no idea why they're yelling at you. You can hear music down the hall or in another room and you might not be able to pick out what kind of music, what genre is it, what instruments are there. Is it actually a truck instead? I don't know. And you might be able to hear me right now, but all this psychoacoustic mumbo jumbo has got you completely confused. Don't worry, I'm with you. So even though someone might be able to hear clearly, does not mean that they interpret what's being said. And likewise, someone who's completely incapable of hearing might be more attuned to this exact speech, this very moment, more than anybody else in the room. And that's where my research comes in. I believe this technology can help people interpret sounds more clearly by delivering sounds through multiple senses at the same time, causing each sense to reinforce the other. And that's where this magic is. But it doesn't mean anything unless it's out in the world. So how do we get it out in the world? Well, that was kind of my question when I started looking into this. I said, well, surely someone has done something like this. I mean, this is not a crazy new idea. It's not something that's impossible to do. But then as I kind of realized, there's not many super stubborn audio engineers that have been playing music their whole life to be able to learn how to rethink and sound. So I got to work. <laughs> I said, okay, uh, if I'm gonna make a new speaker, I need to find out what makes a good speaker. So I started learning how to do soldering and, and all the electromechanical uh, properties of speakers. I started learning how, as much as I could about electrical uh, engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, anything that I could to be able to figure out what made a good speaker. Started making prototypes, 
One of our favorite ones was called the electric chair, for obvious reasons. And it, people really loved the way it felt. It felt like music was going throughout your whole body. But there was a big problem. We can't go around customizing every single chair in a venue. That's just not feasible. So we had to figure out a way to make it modular, make it portable, or make it compact so that way we can send multiple, you can deploy and take them back. So we started figuring out how to modularize it. We engaged the services of a product designer, albeit in Canada, and we started figuring out how to put it onto chairs. The problem with our product designer being in Canada is that as we made it more profound and more complicated, it started looking like a bomb. <laughs> and you see where I'm going with this. So did the TSA. So as we would send it to our product designer in Canada, they would definitely like to pause and take a look at what I was sending across the border and receiving. Now, fortunately, we figured it out with the TSA. Our product designer eventually came back uh, uh, to America, and uh, we were able to modularize it and make it into something that's more of a product, more something that's a little less scary looking. And eventually, we yielded in our ResinX. That's a little circle thing right there. And we call it ResinX because it's able to resonate anything it touches and be able to control the vibrations through that substrate. But along the way, earlier on, when we were making our first prototypes, the university suggested that perhaps we should take a look at maybe starting a startup company. In fact, there's many different startup uh, programs and grants available to startup companies, especially student startup companies. So together, we found the most talented students that we had at UCR. Several of them are sitting right here tonight. And we created a company called Edge Sound Research so we could start accepting investment so we could accelerate these research and development problems. In fact, months after showing the university the technology, they positioned us to present it at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, where we presented it to hundreds of thousands of people and thousands of different companies who are all very interested in working with us immediately to start putting this into different items, the different furnitures, different locations. But two weeks later, the world shut down. And I don't know if you've ever made a hardware startup that is an experiential product during a pandemic, but that's basically a recipe for nothingsville. In fact, neither the team nor the investors could even touch the thing that was designed to express sound through touch so they could figure out what was even going on. And that was very frustrating, but we saw it as an opportunity to focus on the fundamentals. How can people perceive this? Is there anything else that we can do in the meantime? And we focused and we focused. And after the pandemic started to recede, we came out swinging. And that is a bad pun because our first deployment was with the Minnesota Twins Major League Baseball, where we had our Resonix Sound Lounge that was a movable uh, booth that went through in the entire arena. We are currently in phase two out of three out of the NBA Launchpad program, where we are one of seven companies in the world that are helping uh, the NBA enforce elements and enhance different parts of the fan experience, both in venue and in virtual environments. We also just put a deployment in Hard Rock Hotel's newest hotel, Reverb by Hard Rock, that's just opened in Atlanta, Georgia. It's really cool. You should go check it out. We have a sound booth that's completely devoted to this technology right there. And not to be outdone, we're still doing stuff here locally. We've got a system in Aftermath Entertainment, the studio of Anderson Pock, Kendrick Lamar, Eminem, and Mr. Dr. Dre. So at this point, you're probably like, well, well what does it feel like? And you're not wrong. This is the same problem we had during the pandemic. So we've created a little bit of a video clip to try to see if we can have people explain it to you. Check it out. Imagine you're at the baseball field and you see your favorite player walk up to the plate and they smack the best home run you've seen all game. Wouldn't it be so cool to be right there next to them and feel that home run? That's what we can do with Resonex technology. Yeah, that's rad. I'm feeling it like all through my whole body. It's like I'm at the game, but even more. As a music lover and as someone who doesn't do anything except have AirPods in their ears all day, I didn't think I could enjoy music much more. As an artist, this is a game changer. This is an absolute game changer. There's, there's nothing like experiencing a new way to, to 
to feel sound. You actually feel a sense of like being in the sounds. This was, I think I had like what people call an out of body experience. Like so many times I kept repeating like the <gasps> kind of in my head and it just, this brought, my, this brought the song to life like so much better. But this is only the beginning. There's still so much more that we don't know. In fact, with this technology, we're only beginning to understand how the body perceives sound, which is important because it's a stepping stone to understand how the body's other senses can be combined and how we use them to perceive the rest of the world. Even though this tech is in its infancy, we're already receiving so much attention from so many different companies, from therapeutics to industrial machining. And we're definitely getting the attention of some pretty big names out there too. You know, the Samsungs of the world, the Apples of the world, the Boses. And what's even crazier to me is that a music student with a hearing loss is causing all this disruption. And I think that's the important part about today's topic, about going beyond limits. As humans, we come pre-limited with the evolutionary stats that we're given. But two of those traits are persistence and curiosity. These traits are the ones that keep pushing the boundaries. And just to see what's on the other side, see what's possible, see what could be. Reminds me of something I put, don't laugh at this, but in my high school yearbook, which was, with the rate of scientific discovery, we are exponentially approaching, but will never achieve the truth. What a nerd, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Ironically, it's actually more true today than it ever has been, especially with what we're learning about AI. However, I think with our collective persistence and our collective curiosity, always pushing forward to try to find the truth. And by sharing and listening to other people's perspective that we can learn how to understand how they perceive the world, we may not achieve the truth but we can get pretty damn close. Thank you. <laughs>